Cool. All right. Well, thanks for making it to this knowledge sharing session. And I was excited to share some interesting things I do during code review. And then as I sat down thinking about it, I was, I don't know, brought on, there's a level of anxiety because I was like, maybe the things I do aren't that interesting. Um, so that's up for you all to decide, but we're going to, we're going to go through it. Um, so let me share my screen. Let me exit all the Slack. Here we go. All right. So let's see how we can see how well we can present and jump around. Um, all right. So I'm calling this code review tactics because there's a number of random things that I find can come up during code review. And um, the goal as a reviewer is to balance quality and efficiency really well. And so there's some different approaches to problems that can make you more efficient uh, than just sticking to the GitLab UI and scrolling through it. Um, so let's dive into it. Um, before we do that, I want to talk about the objectives of code review, because I think it's really helpful to just keep our mindset framed into what is the scope and what's our purpose of it. I don't know about you all, but every once in a while when I come across a non-trivial MR to review, I can be, uh, I can get a little bit of anxiety and I can feel like there's so much that I have to pick up right away, but it's helpful for me to appreciate um, what my purpose is there. And uh, I'd say that there's two changes is one is, you want to try to understand the changes being made. And then two is optionally giving feedback, uh, if not just a approval. Um, understanding the changes, I I find it's really helpful to just keep track of the inner voice in your head of what questions come up while you're looking at it. And so to to walk away with some assurance that you understand it is, can I answer the questions that are coming up in my head? Um, and if you find that your brain isn't asking questions about the code, like that's that's your place as a reviewer. It's like, okay, we're gonna try to start asking questions about the code and trying to answer them. Um, sometimes there's definitely like some just elements of just walking through and making sure that nothing, you know, is uh, malicious or sticking out that's odd about the code, but um, since we're all maintaining this large software project, we all need to be able to understand it. And if we can't, and if I can't, if I have a question and I can't understand it, that's a great key that my feedback should probably be a question. Um, and so when we give feedback, we want to make sure we can give it in a way that's clear, concise, and complete. Uh, it's really irritating when you have a review and you get some feedback, you go through it, you think you're good to go, but you realize that the reviewer only reviewed like half of it and now they're ready to do the other half. And so you're stuck in multiple merge request cycles because their reviews aren't quite complete. Um, so yeah, all of that begs, we wanna to try to balance efficiency and quality as we review our code. Um, speaking of clear, concise, and complete, uh, do you feel like this is a clear, concise, and complete list of objectives with code review. Would anyone add something to this list? Yeah, I think so too. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, okay, so here's the tactics I wanna walk through. And some of them you've definitely seen if you've paired with me or if we've talked a little bit, or if you hop on the code review weekly workshop, you'll see me do some of these very frequently, um, but let's let's dive into them one by one. So um, the first thing I always do with almost every code review is um, I go through a process of viewing the diff and I don't use the GitLab UI because I find that I regularly need to get my hands dirty in the code almost, like start making changes or start just seeing it in my environment, not necessarily the GitLab UI environment. And so rather than checking out branches or sticking to the GitLab UI, I, at the beginning of the day, 
I check out some relevant main. So if I'm on a project that uses main or master and I want to make sure it's somewhat up to date, that's my branch I'm working off of for reviews. And then I curl and apply diffs. Um, so what does that look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, let's check it out. So I created a, oh, not this. I created a, uh, a little fork of the GitLab project and, and brought the master to a really old commit. And this is one of my old merge requests. And so I was thinking, okay, what would I do if I was reviewing this merge request? I was going to walk through that. So I usually have uh, a GitLab environment uh, and your editor of choice. Ideally, your editor of choice has some sort of terminal and has some sort of source control view. Once you got that, you're, you're in a really good spot to be really efficient and effective with code reviews. Um, so what I do when I'm here is I copy the URL. I make sure I'm on some relevant master main first. So I told you I have forks the GitLab master. So I'm still on my main GDK environment, but my, for all intents and purposes, peace slaughter master is this faux master I'm using right at the moment. So I curl the merge request and I curl it at dot diff. And this actually gives me a bona fide diff of the changes. And then I pipe this to get apply. And boom, now I got the changes all in my local environment. And so I'll walk through them this way. These Ds mean that they're deleted. I can see that this was added. Some things were changed. And this is, this is how I go through my code reviews a lot. I find myself a lot easier and there's a lot less distractions when I can just focus on the code in this way. The one downside, um, I haven't integrated the GitLab workflow extension into my workflow um, because when I make comments, I have to go back to the UI and start making comments. But Thomas, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it should be possible if you use VS Code, I could even make the merge request comments here in the editor itself, right? Yeah, just a different different view. You absolutely can uh, do like view the merge request diff and comment on it, but you can't do it in your diff because this the ref wouldn't match the right. the merge request ref because it's a it's the master or main. Yeah, I'd have to go. I'd have to go to the other sidebar and like open up that merge request. I'd still be going a little bit back and forth, but maybe it won't be as dramatic of a back and forth yeah. um, as me going to the UI. Um, but I also so one of the things I do while I'm reading through things is I'm trying to just get an understanding of it. And I'll what happens a lot to me is as I see something, I'm like, oh well, this should actually be like, you know, we should actually do this while we're doing this and this is almost me taking note of what the comment should be the code change that i'm actually in suggesting or anticipating and so i actually don't go back and forth between the uis a whole lot i just make the change and then i look at oh, okay this is a comment this is what i'm wanting to do so then i uh get this and get my Patch, or if I just left the comment actually in the code, I transfer all of that to the UI. But but that's effectively how I view the diff and the changes. Um, why don't you just why don't you just check out the branch and then then do the diff? Great question. Um, so with the GDK, check switching between branches can be a bit of a time suck because I'm going to be bouncing back and forth between like database migration versions because everyone's on different states of master. One branch may be like a thousand commits behind master. And uh, one for one branch may be really relevant. So I find that I'm not able to work as fast if I'm checking out branches a lot. And so it's like my workflows, I usually have like five ish MRs I got to go through. And there's that. And then the second thing is 
on that MR that's a thousand commits behind, at the end of the day, I don't really care about that branch as much as I care about what does it look like when that branch is merged into main and master. And so if I do review on a relevant master and main, I can catch a different set of issues. Not only do I feel like I can work faster, um, but I can catch a set of issues that wouldn't show up if I was checking out branches. Um, and I like keeping, I like keeping where my merge request changes are here in stage changes. And then my like comments and notes are here in changes. And that, that really helps me with the next step of generating patches. Um, but I, I mean, whatever works for you, that's definitely, you know, yeah. this is just what I find really works well for me. Um, and if you haven't played around with this approach, I highly recommend it because, uh, it's, it's been working really well for me for, for a bit, for a while now, but. Yeah, I definitely get the migration issue. Like I found myself having to do a DB reset several times sometimes when trying to, yeah. Uh, yeah. trying to restart. Yeah. So I get Oh that. my goodness. And then like rails always like freaks out. Cause it like sees a whole bunch of new files. Like yeah, I find myself yeah. having to start, yeah. restart and restart the GDK a lot. And so, mm -hmm. um, I find that I don't run into those issues like at all. Um, when I'm just staying on a branch and just applying um, the changes, um, there's some caveat. So you got to be you got to be comfortable with this approach because there's sometimes you gotta you gotta do a little bit of tricky stuff. And we'll uh, we'll jump into it. Um, so yeah, so I curl the diff of the merge request and apply it. Every once in a while, apply doesn't work, and I don't know. I don't know all of the detail. Oh, let me go back. I don't know all the details on why apply doesn't work, but there's this other thing called AM, which I think is like apply mail or something. It's like expecting from when patches were sent over mail. And apparently it like actually applies when get apply doesn't work. <laughs> I'm revealing my ignorance. Um, and so when get apply doesn't work, I'll pipe it to get am-3. Every once in a while, that won't work because I already have some sort of am thing in progress. And then you have you just want to make sure you run get am abort. So those are the, this isn't a perfect system, uh, but those are the little uh, side things that I do. And I talked about having all of the merge request changes and stage and stage changes. So then I, I get, once everything is applied locally, I stage it all. And that helps me keep track of what I want my review changes to be. Yeah. Okay. I'm using something similar, but I'm yeah. doing like manual merging and resetting. So I would check out the branch that I'm reviewing. I merge it to main, and then I reset soft reset to main. I'll make all the changes as you do them, and then I. Uh, like soft reset back to the merge commit, and that gives me exactly that staging, you know, mm, the, the same yeah. the same uh, list of changes for making patches as as you've got. That's interesting. It you know if I was, I feel, I feel like if I was a smart developer, I would just create like a, a bash script for it. But I've chosen to create some sort of neural pathway for it instead, and so it's. <laughs> Um, I think I, I, whichever one gets you to that state is is helpful. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know if you should create um, should create a script for curl command. That's probably, a... <laughs> it's probably overkill. Um, Dino seems cool though. Maybe I should create a Dino script. Uh, <laughs> um, so then, when I'm doing that as I'm reviewing, I'm either creating a comment because I'm looking at something and something doesn't make sense, and I'm leaving a question, or I actually have code changes I want to make. And so I use git diff, and um, if if I'm in the state that I showed earlier, where things my merge request changes are here in stage changes, and I'm making changes here in changes, I can do git diff, and everything's great. Um, everything's great until I decide to add something uh i don't know okay once i decide to add something when i do git diff 
everything is not great because that's not a track change. So I no longer have it. I'm sure that there's some way for me to keep this edition in changes without moving it to stage changes. But also for other reasons, I find myself sometimes I need to actually commit this block. And now I'm working off of um, a new uh, a new ref. So I'll actually commit all of these merge request changes just to a temporary commit. Oh my gosh, it's running all the left hook stuff. I flip flop and left hook. No verify. Okay. And so then when I have things like unstaged changes, or if I have like a lot of changes and I actually want to generate a bona fide patch file, I'll show that in a second. Um, now I'll get this head and now I get my untracked changes and, and everything all together. So that's one little caveat I do. I have to adjust for, with my workflow a bit. Um, but if I have like a lot of changes, so it's like I'm I'm suggesting a very different approach to the approach that the author took, and and I I don't want to just copy and paste a patch in line. I want to provide a patch file. Um, I will give them a bona fide commit. So I'll actually say something like, you know, hey, we refactored to fill. This does, and I'm almost writing my comment message here. And I always leave the list of like, hey, here's what the patch does. You know, this does foo stuff. You got to foo. Uh, so once I have a bona fide, oh, it's going to let me do this. Why, 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 why? It's probably because I'm on this weird branch or this weird fork that it's not liking. Um, okay. So once I have a bona fide commit, can you all see the terminal pretty well down here? Um, let me go ahead and move it up one. Um, then there's a really cool, and I use this, a, I, I find myself using this bit a lot, but format patch is a really helpful git um, command, which given your current branch, you tell it how many commits to go back and it'll generate that many patches. Um, or you can get, or you can have you can pass it refs like it's very flexible like all the rest of git commands are. But if I do git format patch one, it will give me starting at the head one patch uh, of stuff, and then I will just upload this file to my comment. And rather than having you know sometimes patches can be you know some hundreds of lines, and so I find that's easier on the GitLab than leaving a underlying patch in line uh, in my comment. But yeah, do you all ever, do you all have a preference of ever providing patch files versus inline patch comments when doing merge request reviews? I, I do the same. I provide patch comments with a single file. If it's more than one file and it's a big refactor, then yeah, I would do like a dot .patch file. I just stick it in, in the comment. Lately, I've been opening like a patch in Mars that target the really other branch. Yeah, I've I I haven't ever been able to get that workflow to like feel efficient for me. If it, if you're finding yourself to be able to work efficiently like that, uh, I'd say go for it. I I don't know. I feel like every time I create an MR, I. I get a level of anxiety about all the labels I got to create for it. And like, <laughs> I have a wrapper script that does that for me. Nice. Okay. That's it. That's it. These are these cool scripts I hear about. <laughs> I use the details uh, section that we have in yeah. the comments. And I just put there whatever. It, it, could, it could be hundreds of lines. Even lights, if it's crazy it long. There. Even if it's crazy long. I'm just. I'm always doing git diff, pipe it to the PB yeah. copy, and I'm not doing anything else. Uh, I I think it's all great, except like the email becomes really gnarly, you know? <laughs> but who cares? Uh, yeah. Email goes straight to my notification emails folder in my mm -hmm. email. I see. Yeah, these these are some more automation stuff I've I keep hearing engineers do. Uh 
all of these they 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 harm my my neural pathways so i i try to keep things small um <clears throat> Uh, cool. So I'm going to reset back to this state of the branch that we were at for, as we walk through. But yeah, so this is my bread and what well, we just walked through is my bread and butter for reviewing. And if you're not doing something like this, I highly recommend changing how you do code reviews um, to be more efficient, working off of diffs rather than branches. Um, just try it out because uh, um, my my code review experience was a night and day difference once I was able to um, find an efficient flow like this. Um, okay. All right. So now here's like some specific things I find myself having to do a lot. Um, and there's different approaches towards uh, answering these questions effective and efficiently. Um, but this first one is like, okay, sometimes code is moved the effort of the MR is, you know, there's two things that we want to compare, but it's not a rename. So how do we find a way where we can actually compare side by side? Um, things like this. And I use this uh, pop command a lot. That's because I'm very comfortable in Vim. And there's some, uh, I really like Vim diff. It, it creates these buffers I get to compare, and then I get to play around with the buffers. So I really get to play around and select what do I want to compare side by side? Are these two things similar? Or if they're not, what's different? But as I was typing this up uh, and the wee hours of this morning last night, uh, I was like, I'm sure VS Code has a cool way of doing this. So I'll show both. Um, let me switch over to VS Code. Let me get rid of my cool patch file. Uh, okay, and let me let me curl and apply this thing. So we're reviewing this merge request, and I'm here. I've staged all the changes. So this is a great merge request for showing this case, which is why I cherry picked this merge request um, because the effort of this merge request is refactoring multiple button components into one component. And so I would expect like this new component that's being added to have some significant similarities with these components. Um, but as you can see, I don't get that diff naturally, either in the GitLab UI or when I do it this way. So I got to find another way to compare. And so I like using VimDiff. And so uh, VimDiff is really cool where you can pipe two streams to the command and then it will compare them. So I can pipe anything. And sometimes I'll just cat a file from the GitLab or I'll just curl a file from the GitLab URL uh, to as one of the pipes here. But in this case, I want to pipe something that was deleted. And so what I'm going to do is let's let's see if we can compare this stop workspace button with workspace actions. So I am going to copy the path of this deleted file. And I'm going to, in this first thing, first sub command I'm going to pipe to them diff. I am going to git show. And I can actually do head here because that's that's was our master. Otherwise, I could do like origin slash master, whatever my ref is that does have this file. Um, colon path to master path to that file, and that git show will give me the contents of the file at that ref. Um, I was pretty I was pretty uh, in, impressed. Is not totally the right word. It's pretty normal for like git commands to do like 50 different things, but I think it's funny how git show uh, does so much. And I find myself using this, this little variant of git show a lot. Um, and the next thing I'll pipe to it is I will cat, because this is on disk, I will just cat uh, this file. And so I'm piping two commands to vimdiff and I run it 
And I should get, yeah, a nice side-by-side -side comparison of these two things. And so if I was really just interested in the template, the template, it, it's nice that it's down here. But what I like about this is I can actually like start removing things that I'm like not super interested in comparing. So I can actually like change these buffers uh, quite a bit. And that helps me sometimes like select, it gives me a little warning that I'm changing something that's read only, but it helps me select side by side a very specific selection that I'm wanting to compare. Um, but I find myself, I use Vim diff a lot. Uh, and that's just my personal preference because I'm used to used to Vim. Um, has anyone else used Vim diff in this way of piping commands to Vim diff to compare things? Well, try it out sometime. You might like it. Uh, the other approach, if 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 you don't like Vim in as much, um, uh, you can select a file here in VS Code. I'm sure whatever fancy editor you're using has similar functionality. And in the command prompt, I can go to compare active file yeah. with a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so that's pretty neat. And I can actually open up a buffer of the deleted file and then compare active file with that deleted file. And then I can get the cool side-by-side -side comparison this way. The only downside that why I prefer the Vim diff is sometimes it's like, okay, I really want to compare like line 50 to 58 with like a, another line that's deeply nested here. And Vim diff, I'm able to delete lines and get them lined up a little better. Um, here, I won't be able to like adjust this side a whole lot because it's this actual buffer, which is this deleted file. So this is like in a read-only state. And if I start making changes in here, these are actually going to be my workspace actions changes. So it's when I do, when I pipe the commands in Vim, if those are actually just different, those aren't the actual files. I can start just playing around with them. But yeah, I was... There is a there is Go a ahead. trick to it, so Paul, with this um, Vim, uh, sorry, not with the Vim, with VS Code, the thing, you can copy something in your clipboard, like a small small snippet, and then you can select something in the other buffer and say compare selection with clipboard. Oh. So if you are interested with no. how ch chunks Serious? map to each other. Is ah, it like okay, all, all right. It's it's probably my extension. I do. It's have an extension. extension. Oh, okay. It's an extension. Yeah. Like a cop clipboard compare. I think it's called right. or something like that. I see. And I that's see. what I'm using a lot. Sorry. But this is pretty close though. Like I can compare active file with clipboard. It's pretty close, but it's not. It's not. It's yeah. I think and I've heard that extension too. So if you use VS Code, let's see if we can look up the extension real fast. Yeah. Uh, I and I yeah. use Gitlands. Gitlands has also has that you can compare active file with any file for you can like select the branch and then select. The oh file. yeah. Yeah, I've seen yeah. that too. Get, yeah, Gitlands has good uh, the compare. extension is partial partial diff. The third one from the yeah. Partial diff. Wow, one million and five stars. Pretty good extension. Uh yeah. Yeah. And it, it pays a lot to have a tool like this or have some sort of process where you can do this because moving code around happens a lot and you can save yourself so much time if you can just get the get the diff lined up. Cool. Uh, let's move on. Um, so these are fun problems. I don't know how much... Um, I don't know how much they run into... Uh, in the back end because of the way Rubocop, um, we have these like Rubocop files. I find we do um, this kind of problem happens a lot when we're like migrating front end code or we're adding like a linter disable comment. And sometimes we do it to like hundreds of files at a time. And let me see if I can find one of those MRs and show what I do. Um, Uh, I don't know how much time I actually save doing this as much as I like to just, I like to just flex to myself, like 
Yeah. I was just going to say, I just remember this command off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so every once in a while, it's like, yeah, we got an MR and it's doing kind of the same thing um, a bunch of times. Um, and in this instance is like, okay, you can just give a, you know, a nice little scroll through and you're probably good. Sometimes we're actually changing like the line itself multiple times and it could be really nice to just like there's so much noise to the actual bits that I'm wanting to review. But since I already do things through the terminal, uh, what I'll do, um, well, I won't be able to just curl the diff here because it's already merged. So let me just diff it with this or something. Let me see if I do get diff, let me go back one to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I get everything. Okay. So if you do that and then you do um, like unified equals zero, then you get like no extra context for your lines changed. And that could be helpful at just like scrolling through it. Um, I find different use cases. Sometimes I need to like get that view. But then if you really want to go super minimal, you can grep just uh, from the beginning of the line. I want to grab minus space or plus space. And then now I have just the lines that were either added or removed. And um, that's pretty nice. I can even then pipe it to sort and unique. And it's like, okay, these are the only lines that were added in this MR. Um, for something that's like 39 files, is like, that's not that bad. But we've definitely done this when it's like, and the two hundreds of files, uh, and it could be nice to just actually verify something like that. Um, yeah, can you even think of any other use cases that like just viewing a very very condensed of give me just what kind of lines were changed would be helpful? I can't think of any either. No, I've definitely run across it though. <laughs> um, definitely run across it a lot with this kind of MR, or if we're doing like we're we're changing a rule, so we have to update a bunch of code to follow the rule, that kind of thing. Um, but definitely don't want to waste too much time on those MRs. Um, okay, I'm so excited to show this one because this happens all the time. So how do we? find out what's actually changed since the last time I look at this thing. Uh, so going back to my playground MR here. So I added the comments that Enrique added on my actual MR. So apparently somehow he found that there were some things to improve with my MR, which is uh, just that's a little surprising, but that's fine. Um, I'm joking. And I did the thing where, okay, well, I'm going to also rebase with master because we were super behind and then push my changes. And that's not always the nicest thing to do to the reviewer, <clears throat> but sometimes it happens. And when this happens, it could be very difficult to like, okay, hey, Enrique, I made the changes to find out what the changes were. Because if I go compare with previous version, since it includes all of the master changes, it's crazy huge. Um, so I don't know if you all have ever run across this problem where it's very difficult to find what's actually changed. Um, thankfully, uh, there's some ways around it. So the one bit of information we need that we don't have locally in our repo, because if I fetch from latest master, I should have all the master commits. But the one thing we don't, we may not have now, if I did check this out locally and stuff, I might have it, but it's very possible I don't have it. Is I may not have uh, this commit um, in my local stuff, but there's a way we can pull it. So what we'll do is I'll fetch from origin just this SHA. Um, so even though the branch, nothing points to this, Somehow GitLab actually still keeps a reference around for these old references. And that's super helpful. Um, 
So here I am. I am, uh, let me go ahead and start on clean slate. And I'm going to do git fetch. I'm working off this fork. So we would normally do origin, but I'm using my, my fork. And then I do this SHA, which is my old, the last time I viewed the commit changes. And when I fetch, Git puts it all in this thing called fetch head. So if I do git show fetch head, I can see that commit. And uh, that's cool. Okay. So then here's the magic. I find myself often diffing diffs. And so I will diff from whatever the old base was to fetch head. And then I will diff from the current main to the new SHA of the merge request. And that helps me answer the question pretty quickly. So if I do vim diff, git diff, and the old one, I can I could do a whole git merge base thing, but I'm just gonna go uh I'll go to I think I could just go to this commit. I don't think I need to do the fetch head stuff. Um I might have to do the fetch head stuff. Yeah, we'll go ahead and do the fetch head stuff. If I do fetch head and go back one fetch head. And then I'll do git diff uh key slaughter master to the current SHA. So I'll look at the commits, like okay, this is the current SHA of this. Boom. Now I'm getting a diff of the diffs. And so I see I'm not concerned about additions that are added on both sides. I'm concerned about new additions to one side or new removals to another side. Uh, so here, that was a bit of context that Enrique gave me. Is like, okay, we need to add that state. Um, okay, it looks like I fixed some sort of typo there. Uh, and then here, it looks like I was removing these, but I'm not removing them anymore. Um, okay, we add or, uh, oh yeah, it looks like some things changed under the hood. So I, when I remove this file, there's another bit that was also removed. Um, it's a little trippy to diff diffs. Um, at the very least, if you don't have to totally understand what's happening by diffing the diffs, because that's that could be very challenging to do. But at the very least, this should give you context of okay, what was the blast radius of the last change? Like what what things did we actually touch? And then now when I'm actually reviewing the code, rather than reviewing it from a diff of diffs, I'll go to my actual review state and it's like, okay, I, I it is just these changes that changed as I would expect. Um, I've definitely done diff of diffs and it's caught loads of sneaky things that um, happened because of funky rebases or other things like that, which would have slipped through if I wasn't you know, being cautious of, okay, what's actually changed in this 30 plus file changed MR over, over time. Um, and I, and I don't want to work efficiently, so I don't want to re-review all the files all over again. So I really want to checkpoint myself of okay based on the last time i looked at it what has actually changed is is a really important question to answer does that have any thoughts about about this approach has anyone used this kind of thing before uh, i think this is super useful i i like squash changes many times to rebase and then i forget where i started and that's like uh, this could be really useful that I, I mean diff diff server diff can probably yeah, it's probably gonna ruin my head, but um, yeah, I, I'll try this next time. Cause I, I lose my commits all the time, and I'm like, oh, I squashed all this stuff, and then I need to go back one. Mm. <clears throat> and yeah, this could be this could be useful for that. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, it's, it could be very confusing as um, things change. And the one one thing to just gotcha is like when you're diffing diffs. I'm not concerned about lines like this one here um, because this is a context line. So it's just telling me that the context around my change has changed and I'm not super concerned about that. I'm really concerned about lines that start with a minus or a plus. Uh, yeah. 
If you're not comfortable reviewing diff of diffs, um, I recommend uh, getting comfortable with it. Uh. <laughs> did did you remove unified? Did you make unified zero when you did that, or you you? Would, no, right? no, no, no. I didn't do that. Um, and I, maybe that's a good idea. Um, I'm not sure why. Let me think why. Yeah, I didn't do that because I don't know if all of the lines would line up as accurately um, when I'm diffing diffs in that way. Uh, but yeah, I think I really just use this. Sometimes I can get lucky and I'm like, oh yeah, this was all the changes I was expecting. Boom, we're good to go. Sometimes this raises more questions of like, oh wow, we added a whole bunch of other stuff I wasn't expecting. Or we deleted a whole bunch of other stuff I wasn't expecting. I'm not going to do the review here. That's when I'm I'm now going to write that question down or keep it in my head and, and actually start a new review process. Um, this is really just to help me get a sense of what's changed. Uh, yeah. How are we on time? We're at time, aren't we? We can go for another 10 minutes if you have. Okay. This is this uh this isn't gonna take long. I wanna I do want to demo this bit. I'm not really gonna demo this last bit, but if you're reviewing test coverage, like if you're asking yourself, do we have good test coverage here? I highly recommend adding this to your arsenal of uh rather than line for line reviewing the production code and the test code, um, doing what's called mutation testing. And so look at the unit that's under test, be running your test. And if you can introduce a bug in the unit and the tests still pass, the tests are not good enough. Um, there's obviously with some discretion there, uh, but if it's, you know, this approach can reveal uh, lines of code that are just uncovered. And sometimes there's branches of code that aren't covered, even though the line is technically run. Um, so example of how I do this, if I, let's go back to our MR that we've been playing with here. Okay. So I've got my MR here. Let's see if I can run these specs that we added. Let's see if it works. Here we go. Run in specs. So I'll definitely review like, okay, we're we're doing just like one expectation per spec. The order of things makes sense. We're not like um we're not digging into like any any internals, like there's certain red flags to our tests that we want to watch out for. But I can I can give a quick once over and be like, okay, yeah, these seem like well formed tests. Um I find it really difficult to review like brand new test files because sometimes they could be like 500 lines long and the unit's 200 lines long. And so I really just want to check, are these organized well? And are are we doing pretty decent testing practices? I'm not super concerned line for line at the moment. Um, but for me, the way I test for coverage is I run the test like I have it running right now. And then I start introducing bugs. So I'm here in the unit and okay. So if I, if, let's see if I can just not do this. And that gives me some certainty is like, oh, we've got a test covering that line. I was like, okay, cool. Um, here in the template, I could say something like, okay, well, what if we actually didn't set the icon? That would totally be a bug. Uh, are we asserting that we set the icon correctly? And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, it looks like, looks like we have that. Um, this is also, I use this for myself to like know if I'm, you know, having good test coverage. So when I wrote this in the past, I'm sure I did something similar. Uh, but let's, um, let us uh, go ahead and like delete a bit of tests, assuming that these, this test wasn't added and what that would look like when I was trying to catch it. Um, so here, if I deleted this line, okay, and the test still pass, 
this is telling me, okay, there's a bit of behavior that we're depending on that's not technically covered by tests. And this would cause a, a visual issue. Um, and so I would leave a comment. And sometimes I'm leaving the comment with this patch uh, of the file saying like, hey, when I introduce this bug, or sometimes it's a whole bunch of lines, because I'll do this for one whole file. It'll be like, all of these lines, I was able to change like 50 of them and the test still pass. And that's, I, I show that patch to the author and I'm like, hey, can we make sure we have coverage for these lines and these behaviors? Um, and I find that to be a very effective way of getting a feel for like, okay, how are we at coverage wise here? Uh, does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about that? Do people already, do we already do that? I knew it wasn't interesting. I thought it was cool, but I knew it was like everyone's already doing this. Um, yeah. I, I don't think anyone is that thorough. I, I don't think I try to break the test purposefully to um, to try to figure out whether there's an issue. Um, yeah. I, it's, um, it seems like a lot of work because there's so many permutations of what you could break. I mean, it depends obviously on the size of the MR, but um. Like it, it, I guess it depends on how many tests have been added. If if it's like change tests and TCI, I suppose. Um, yeah, for so it's for a me, it's new like test file, I can delete. It's... I usually don't have to. So we have a pretty cool UI feature in GitLab of where we'll show like if a line isn't even getting hit. Mm -hmm. So in those situations, it's kind of indicative to me of like, okay, I can delete the line, and the lines of tests are still going to probably pass. Um, but some things that can happen for sure is like we have certain conditions. Uh, this isn't this file is not a good example, but we have certain conditions and we run through it, but we only ever run through it on true. So it's like if I'll just rewrite the condition to false and it's like, oh, well, we actually don't ever do that. Or so I'm always trying to make a mute. They call this this approach is called mutation testing. Highly recommend looking it up. And there's actually cool libraries that run through this to assert the strength of your test suite, which um, which uh, is is interesting. Although it's it's a hard problem because uh, you got to run the tests a lot and make these mutations and stuff. Um, but uh, mutations are pretty you want, they're pretty small. They're usually like flipping values deleting a line it's like a line at a line mutation that you that you introduce that would that would produce some sort of buggy behavior um and i i find myself able to review large amounts of tests and give very helpful feedback quicker than if i was just looking at the test line by line when i'm actually able to play around with it um so try it out um there might be a, a, might seem a little uncomfortable at first, but even with your own tests, try it out of like, okay, can I can I reveal some weaknesses in my test suite? Um, and I think it'll be a rewarding experience. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely try this with yeah with my own code uh, when writing it, but I've not thought to try it with test code. Usually, I'll be in the GitLab UI. I'll look at the code. And I'm like, okay, there's an if condition. And I'll scroll down, where's the test for that? And I'll scroll back up, else condition, look for the test. And that, now that you've mentioned this, that does seem very slow. So I'll definitely try this in the future and hopefully cool. it speeds things up. Yeah, it's it's nice in the front end because you don't have to, sometimes our Rails tests are slow. So in the front end, I could definitely move faster. Um, the Rails tests can be slow because they all still depend on the database and stuff. So. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely just worth playing around with it. Um, it's it's just a tool in the tool belt. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, well, at the for the sake of time, um, I'm I'm gonna just, uh, we'll go to the last bit here. Um, but I've had I've uh, found myself not feeling confident about a huge refactor we're doing. I find myself in that position a lot. Um, maybe that's a side effect of some anxieties that I don't like to admit to, but uh, I like to think that we all find ourselves in that situation. Um, 
there's some cool tactics you can do when uh, you want to verify that a refactor is a bona fide refactor. And so many times ago, we um, wrote some documentation in our uh, GitLab development docs about this thing called pinning tests. So these would be tests that you do not commit to master. And they're very like implementation detail specific tests. Um, but they help us catch things we wouldn't expect to look for. It's like this bit is so big and has so much context to it. I don't totally know. Like I'm going to try to run through the UI like some cases, but maybe I don't even have things set up. Um, what this is about is let me go back to the slide. Ah, um, sorry, I didn't mean to click. This is about um, you change the app either at runtime or at test time, and you're going to create a Oracle pen and then like a test pen. So the Oracle pen will be, we're going to assume whatever is on master is correct. And so at runtime, or I'll create a one-off little test for this thing. We're going to a pen could be like, we're going to create a snapshot of the whole HTML page um, at this state. Then we apply the changes and I create another snapshot of the whole HTML page and not a visual snapshot, like the actual HTML of the pen with the changes. And then I'm going to diff those. And I find that every once in a while, this has helped me efficiently catch things we overlooked and issues. Um, and I don't recommend doing it all the time, but if something warrants it, like it's a high traffic um, piece of code that users run into all the time and there's technical debt and it's complex and we're doing a lot at once, um, this is the kind of thing that could be that could be helpful. In our guide, we have some examples of where we've run pinning tests. Um, so a really, I think, in, intuitive um example of this is when we used to, when we sometimes had to migrate things from Hamel to view. So looking at the commit history, we actually had a commit where we set up a pinning task for this. And like what, what this is doing is like, you have a huge Hamel page. Let's see what it looks like. Yeah, somewhere around here. You have a huge Hamel page with all these Hamel partials and everything like that. And we are rewriting all of it into this huge view component. So uh, there's a lot of complexity involved. But what I'll do with the pinning test is um, I'm committing all of these Oracle snapshots of the HTML. And I'm introducing this test to create these snapshots. And so what I'll do is when we actually have implemented our changes, I'll reintroduce these pinning tests, run the snapshots and compare the HTML side by side. And that helps us refactor things that have some technical debt and complexity with uh, a lot more confidence. So in this case, the snapshots are HTML files, but snapshots can also just be log files. Um, it's anything that helps me pin down the application. It's it's way more invasive than a unit test that we try to just test like public methods and stuff like that. This is you're metaphorically placing a pin down on the application uh, and then comparing what happens when things change. That's a pinning test. Yeah, if you haven't checked out this document, if you're interested in, um, if you're interested in overly complicated approaches to uh, engineering problems. You can read pending tests. That's it. We did it. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, we, we pretty much at time. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, and uh, cool. look forward to the next one. Thank yeah. you. All right. Thanks. See you.